been coming here for, I think, 15 or 50 years. It's hard to know. Um, this is a little bit of hands-on also. So if you feel comfortable, take off the shoe you'd like to take off, because we're going to do some hands-on. And if you don't feel comfortable, try to convince your neighbor that you could use his or her foot so that you'll know where we're going to. Um, many of the things we will be talking about, we will demonstrate in the labs. And this is my wonderful wife, Phyllis, who is, her specialty is this, and she always keeps me on track and she tries to check my mic. <laughs> Jeff likes to play with the rear. <laughs> Isn't that, that better? I don't know. Hello, that's better. That's better. And after listening to Carl, we now are going from head to toe. <laughs> so if everybody would take off one shoe, or not everybody, but whoever feels comfortable doing it, that will save time. As uh, Jeff said in the very beginning of his talk, that most of us are somewhat ADD, and most of us are fairly anal, so we keep fixing and fixing and fixing and fixing our slides. So when you get the, um, the thumb and you look at my slide, it's not exactly, it's been different, a little bit different, but in essential. So we're going to talk about rehabilitative injection technique for foot and ankle ligaments. Actually, it's prolotherapy, <laughs> but this sounds so much more important. <laughs> Now, all of you know that the foot basically has four functions. The first function, which everybody knows, we're standing on our feet. The foot is such a solid, wonderful structure that it holds us upright on the ground. Two, it is a shock absorber. We have so many joints. Now, if I was God, I would not make a foot this way. I'd make one block, and that's it. Why do we have shock? Why do we have joints? We have joints because they're shock absorbers. What destroys joints, bodies, muscles are, or is actually, the shock of called ground reactive forces. And as shock travels, it is dampened by the muscles. Therefore, we have muscles pain. Two, it's an accelerator of forward movement. That means when you toe off, you have to move your whole body forward and it pushes you off of the ground. And then four, it's a decelerator of forward motion. Now, take your weight times two, add a half. That's how much force go through your heel every time you take a step. So it's not unreasonable, as Dr. Patterson told us today, about having micro fractures in the heel, which will lead to what? Plantar fasciitis. Okay, now let's talk about plantar fasciitis. I hear this all day long. I have plantar fasciitis. How do you know you have that? Well, I read it on the web. Well, that must be true. Plantar fasciitis is, as Dr. Patterson told you, probably plantar fasciosis. It's a tear in the muscle. And it is generally caused by the failure of foot deep ligamentous structure. What you have to know, and we'll get to that, is that the ligaments are for stability, and muscles are made for what? Movement. Can a, move, a thing that is made for movement be stable? No, it cannot. So, when the fascia fail, when the ligament fail, what is going to try to stabilize the foot, the back, the neck, the shoulder? Will be the muscles. Are muscles able to do that? The answer is no. So we have muscle pain, muscle spasm. Look for the cause and not the symptoms. Most of us are in our practice, people come in and tell us their pain symptoms. Am I really interested? I'm only interested in your pain symptom so I can get to the cause of your pain symptom. If I can treat the cause, your symptoms should disappear if I am right. And 50% of the time I'm okay. <laughs> Which is bad. Now, 
one of the really interesting things, and let me just tell you this, I've been doing this for almost 50 years, a half a century. So many things I'm going to tell you are things I've observed. And I come to all of these lectures, I speak with all of the people in here, and we exchange ideas on a daily basis. So these are things I have personally observed. You may observe something different, but it's okay. <coughs> One, the plantar ligament is what holds the foot together. It protects and helps the plantar fascia. Now let me just say one thing about the plantar fascia I forgot to say before. The plantar fascia is really the long tendon of the gastroc muscle. It's been adapted, like most things will adapt, to, to function, but the plantar fascia is a long tendon of the gastroc muscle. And when the plantar fascia fails, the gastroc, the Achilles tendon problem. Well, let's think if we can remember, because I couldn't rem follow uh, Dr. Osborne, I never look at the head, or rarely, but take my word for it, the gastroc muscle ends on the femur. The two heads of the gastroc end in the femur. And what is there? The biceps femoris muscle or your hamstrings. So if you have a failure of the plantar, what's going to happen with the bicep? It's going to try to accentuate that. Where did the bicep insert in or originate from? The ischial tuberosity. Well, we've all heard lectures on the ischial tuberosity, and what does that blend in with? The sacral tuberous ligament. And where do the sacral tuberous ligament end? or begin, depends on which way you're looking at it. Well, it ends in the sacrum, one, two, and three. So would it be reasonable to say that if I have a plantar fasciitis, I could have low back pain? Would everybody agree that that's a reasonable expectation? So when somebody comes in complaining of low back pain, maybe you should tell them to take off their shoes. <laughs> Maybe not. They may not have washed their shoes. They washed everything else because they didn't know you were going to ask them to take off their shoes. <laughs> okay. Let's look at the ligament anatomy of the foot. This is very difficult. It looks great in netter. It looks great in all the anatomy books. But when you do dissection, it doesn't look at all like this. And I tried that. I thought, I've been doing this for, what, at that time, 40 years. I thought, oh, I must be a and I once was a surgeon, by the way, but I went to three, I went to AA, and I no longer became a surgeon. <laughs> so, as Dr. Trister told us about the biotensegrity, we have compression elements and we have tension elements. Ligaments are generally tension elements. So let's talk about our tension elements. One, you have the calcaneonavicular, or the spring ligament. The navicular uh, cuneiform ligament, cuneiform first metatarsal, calcaneal cuboid, the short plantar, and of course the long plantar. Forget it. You just heard it. We'll talk about it a little bit more. Don't try to memorize it. It is. It's the big stuff. Now, let's look at the plantar ligaments. We're going to go through it. And why is this important? Different muscles attaches to different ligament and they all do different things. And when a ligament fails, the muscle is right behind it because they all share the interthopic plate. So when one fails, it has to fail. So the plantar, first we have the spring ligament, the navicular cuneiform ligament, the cuneiform first metatarsal, and the way you remember this, you just remember your bones. Um, the list frank ligament, which we see a lot of injuries in high jumpers and in runners, sprinters, never in swimmers. You never see this in swimmers. <laughs> and finally, the plantar ligament, the short plantar ligament, and the long plantar ligament there. Now, everybody who has their shoe off, or their partner has their shoe off, or somebody has to shoe off, it, but if you're very visual, you don't need to. We're going to isolate where these ligaments are. And if you're going to inject, 
much like Dr. Osmond, I'll call him Carl, showed you, you need to have your landmarks. Because if you don't have landmarks, the patient is in trouble. You'll go home, you'll be okay. <laughs> okay. Here is the spring ligament. How do we find it? We put one finger in front of our ankle joint. You come down, you feel the tip of your finger, and that's where you're going to want to inject one bone for the spring ligament. The next one is the navicular cuneiform ligament. And how many fingers do you think we're going to use on that one? You're right. Two, and you'll feel the joint. Can you feel that joint right underneath your finger? You'll feel that. That's a great ligament to know, and I'll explain why. And finally, oh, well, I guess I will tell you now. The reason is the posterior tibial muscle is there, and that muscle is going to affect your knee and your back. And if you don't know where it is, and you keep treating the back and the problems in the foot, nobody's going to like you. <laughs> so, let's go forward there. The posterior tibial muscle, and this is why this one's so important. Remember, when you look at muscles, you know, they look really great in the anatomy book. This looks like this, this looks like this. And then when you get into the cadaver, it all looks alike. When I remember taking anatomy, so I went to Dr. Brighton, who was our anatomy professor, and I said, I just found a new nerve that is not <laughs> written in any other textbook. And I felt so proud of him. And he went over and he said, uh-huh, the freshman's nerve. <laughs> and he wore, it was a plantaris muscle. <laughs> it didn't look like that in the book. So the, po the posterior tibial muscle which sits on the fascial plate, ends up being the popliteus, or the popliteus, whichever way you wish to announce it. And what does that do? That stabilizes the knee joint so that you don't have general requiverum, where the knee doesn't pop backwards. And when they do knee surgery, what do they screw up? The popliteus muscle. And they come in, that damn orthopod on my knee. But it's the popliteus, but that depends on the posterior tibial. That's why it's important to know that two fingers in the foot is where you're going to be looking for the insertion of the posterior tibial muscle. Now, the navicular cuneiform, which is my favorite, um, is three fingers. In front, and why is that one important? Well, you'll never guess. Let's, let's find it. It's important because the perineal muscle is attached there. The perineal muscle, where does that go? Okay, let's talk about it. Go ahead. Three fingers, please feel in front of your foot from the ankle, three fingers, you'll feel that joint. That is the really gem. Why is it the gem? Because one, the perineal muscle has multiple functions. <laughs> Number one, you everybody ever see a bunion? People come in and complain about their bunions. <laughs> well, the, what holds that bunion in place happens to be the cuneiform first metatarsal ligament. And as it keeps going up and down when you walk, it la becomes lax. And what's attached to that? Well, the perineal muscle. And why is the perineal important? The perineal muscle runs up the outside of your leg and it ends in the posterior cruciate ligament of the knee. So if you do not look at that in knee pain, maybe that posterior cruciate ligament that everybody's so hard to try to operate on could be really repaired by stabilizing the knee joint and doing prolo on the first, um, what's the name, the first metatarsal cuneiform joint. And it works very well. Now what is fascinating, how many of you do acupuncture? Great, terrific. 
Do you know what that point is over there? That's the acupuncture point for the hip pain. And let me show you that. Go ahead. <coughs> this is how we inject it. And you'll see, I use, I use primarily diabetic insulin syringes. Why? Because, you know, if I have a gallon, I'm going to use a gallon. And being really stingy, I want to use as little of this stuff that I can. And that needle is so sharp. I think it's like a 32, 33 gauge needle. So, and it's just the right size. It's a half inch barrel. So you won't be off of, off of anything. You'll be right in there and it's quick and it's easy. And you can see, you bam, you're right there. Okay. Now, the plantar ligament really becomes the crux, the crux of the foot muscle. And when you have failure, that's the one that's going to fail. Why? It goes to the cuboid. Now, you all know, because you're all doctors, that the atlas is the bone in which the whole head turns. The cuboid bone is the bone which everything in the foot works around. All of your intrinsic muscles, that's the muscles in the foot, that start in the foot and end in the foot, and your extrinsic muscles that start in the leg and end in the foot. It is either the fulcrum or the attachment. So when that bone is subluxed, and it's not in good position, all of the muscles can't function the way they have been made to function. So, and why does it fail? It fails because we have laxity of the ligament. Now, ligaments stretch for multiple reasons. Most of them is for bad posture in the foot, probably in the neck too, it's probably bad posture and not addressing special foot structures, which we'll talk about a little bit on. So the cuboid has two ligaments, the long ligament, the long plantar ligament, and the short plantar ligament. And it holds that beautiful foot structure together. How do you find that? Take your hand, take two fingers on the outside of your foot, you go forward to the middle of the foot, and you'll press on your index finger there, and you'll feel the cube, you'll feel the plantar ligament. Okay. Now that we should use a red a red needle. That's the two inch twenty five gauge needle, and that takes a little bit of skill and we'll teach you how to do it. And once you learn how to do it, it's very easy. But you know, I, I'm sure that if you'll talk to any of us, whatever you do a lot of tends to be easy for you and tends to be difficult for everybody else. But it's a practice skill, it's a tactile skill. Okay? Now, you'll notice we never come from the bottom of the foot. Why? Well, because, number one, the foot has been adapted to be the most sensitive structure that you have. And supposedly, I wasn't there, although I am that old, when we lived in caves, none of your relatives did, but mine did. When you lived in caves, you always slept with your head closer to the fire and your feet to the door. Because when the bear would come in, he'd gnaw on your feet and not on your head. So your head feet became really sensitive. So we like to come through. Let's we go through the one finger. Remember I told you about the one finger? There's a special notch there. And if you'll come right there, you will hit the cuboid bone. And we come through that structure because it's very safe and it's not painful. Not painful at all. I, although my office is called Foot Pain Center, um, it really, we try not to, but when patients come in and say, oh, that hurts, I said, didn't you read the sign? <laughs> <laughs> We're not hedonists. Well, maybe. 
Um, <laughs> anyway, the one structure you have to worry about is the nerve, the posterior tibial nerve that branches underneath there. If you go where I'm showing you to go, you, you're safe. If you come from the plantar aspect, you have a good probability of doing a biopsy, a nerve biopsy. And if you use a big enough needle, you really will get it. There was a lawsuit in South Carolina, I was asked to testify for it, where one of my colleagues went to this $9,000 a week or two week prolotherapy course, and he was taught to come through the bottom, through the plantar aspect, and he biopsied the nerve. So then the orthopod or the neurosurgeon went back and fixed it. The person got RSD, or chronic regional pain syndrome, and you know who got sued? And they asked me to testify, and I said, there's no way that I'm testifying in this court under oath, because it's just totally wrong. And it looks easier that way, they well, I'll just go through there. Well, that's good. I sometimes go over 70 miles an hour. I also have, as my wife will tell you, a special driving permit. If you don't, Phyllis understands that my insurance rates went up. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> she drives faster than I do. She does 80 and 90 miles an hour, never gets a ticket. I go 73, I get a ticket. <laughs> so, this is the, how we do it. You can see the needle. And you see where I'm at. And I gently, I'm right on the ligament there. And it's easy. If you have a bad ligament or a dysfunctional pathological ligament, it's like butter. If it's a healthy ligament, I have arthritis in my thumb already from trying to get it in there. And as I'm doing this, you can't see, I'll show you in lab, I can get the entire foot with one injection. Three cc's, the entire bottom of every ligament that I talk to you about, all five of them, with one cc. And you can see I'm feeling, I'm letting my, my hand feel where I'm at. And you see how easy it is? Now I'm on the heel, where the endothopic plate of the plantar fascia is. And I'm just walking it across that heel bone. And you'll feel it. It's so easy to do. Just go boom, boom, boom. But you don't draw your needle out. You just let that needle do. And I always think of myself, of I think was his name, Geller, the one who could bend my metal. And sometimes I'll take out my needle and you'll see that it's really twisted like a corkscrew. And my wife isn't watching this. Who are you injecting that? Prolo. Oh, the solution, my solutions are really simple. It is 50% lidocaine, marcaine, a mixture of both, and I'll explain later why I do that. And 50% um, glucose and a couple drops of sodium moiuate. Why do I use 25%? Because you know it comes in a 50 cc vial, right? And if you do 25%, it's so much easier than 18%, 19%. It, you know, it's too much math for me. I'm a podiatrist, for God's <laughs> sakes. So I know half and half. <laughs> and there, we're done. And that whole thing took about less than a minute. Now, after you do the injection, this is the part that people do not do, except probably the osteopaths. The MDs don't do this, the osteopaths do. How many of you are osteopaths and chiropractors? Great, you guys are terrific. I won't ask you about the other ones. Um, you need to learn to manipulate. Now, manipulate or mobilization is just putting everything in alignment. And you do that gently. You don't have to hear a crackle, pop, and all that. Although sometimes I do because I just want to hear the noise. Um, but you just gently wish to push it back into place. And the way you do that is you do the cuboid, which I told you is the most important. You just divide the foot in half, 
put in a medial to lateral pressure and just walk the foot around it and the cuboid will just ease itself right into place. And for the talonavicular, the posterior tibial, the um, perineal muscle, just put your thumb there and you gently, gently just walk the foot around it and it goes right into place. The foot is numb. There's no resistance. It just moves into place. Now, after you do that, what becomes very important, because you want it to heal. Well, you're standing down on it, you know, and what's happening to the ligament you just inject? It's opened up. You want to keep it in a shortened, constricted position so that it will heal. And what do, were we told today about the healing process? From three days to 14 days. So we keep it taped, and I'll teach my patients how to do that. And we keep it taped, and watch this. And I brought tape with me, so I'll hopefully be able to teach that in the lab. And I use my chest wall to, to feel what, what I want to do. And, I, and this is paper tape, 3M paper tape. Um, I like paper tape. And it proves something to you that it's not the strength of the tape that's holding it, but it's the tensile strength. And why does taping work? Proprioception. It has nothing to do with stabilization. It's the largest organ for all of us is the skin and it has more nerves and I like the 3M paper tape it's the easiest one to work with and the one that the patients like the most and that's it and for anyone who wants to know there is a code to get paid for this very important now we learned everything about the feet that we need to know, and we're going to move on to the ankle. Please save your questions to the end, so write them down if you need to, and I'll try to answer everything that I can. So let's talk about prolotherapy for the ankle joint. Now, most of us will be talking about the athlete, but most of us really don't treat athletes. They have the high school, college, you know, coach, that knows everything there is to know and puts on 23 pounds of tape and sends these poor boys out to kill himself. And Phil and I live near a high school and we watch these little tights. They must be like maybe three feet tall. And they're dressed in these things. We live in Appalachian. We go for big people. So they get them all dressed up and they send them out to bang their heads against each other and get brain concussion. And that may prove why we have such great educational um, anyway, but let's talk about what's interesting about the anatomy of the unstable ankle joint. Well, remember I spoke about the cuneiform metatarsal ligament and how the uh, perineal muscle attaches there? Well, in order to hold everything in place, the perineus muscle comes from the lateral side, and to hold it in place, you must have some kind of guide wire. And I tell my patients, because they're all fishermen and hunters. I said, you know, think of going fishing and take one of those little eyelets where the line goes through. You know, take, take it off and throw your line out. What's going to happen? Oh, I can't throw it like that. So I said, well, it's the same thing with a muscle. If you tear the <laughs> ligament, then the muscle is kind of like hanging out there and it's going to be slipping all over and not functionally well, so the perineal muscle goes through the lateral ankle ligament. And what happens to the perineal muscle after it passes the knee? It becomes the tensor fascia lata. And I have people coming in, especially some of my great young athletes, and they do stretches and stretches and stretches. But I tell them, well, muscles don't stretch. Muscles either torque open or torque close. They do not stretch. When they stretch, they tear. So, 
there all these wonderful exercises doesn't work. But if they would just do prolo where the insertion of the perineal muscle is, they will end up getting rid of their, te their tensor fascia lata. And they'll complain to you, especially when they come in with hip pain, you say, does it burn on the side of your thigh? Oh yeah, it burns, it's like somebody put a match to it. Okay, that muscle, the tensor fascia lata, when you look in the Gray's Anatomy, what it turns out to be, it's the largest, bulkiest muscle in your body. What is that? The gluteus maximus. And the, what does that do? That goes up to the iliac crest. Well, we all know from our anatomy that the muscle doesn't attach on the iliac crest. It blends into the iliolumbar fascial plate or the thoracolumbar fascial plate. And where does that end? That ends at L3, L4. Well, you think maybe L3, L4 pain may be coming from an unstable ankle? I see it every day. Patient will come in, I don't know what you did, doc. You just take my foot, my back pain went away. Oh, that's interesting. So anyway, let's now talk about pathology. This is Roger Federer. And watch how he twists that ankle when he comes down. I love watching him. Boom, ooh, that's gotta hurt. He can get away with it. We don't. And I've watched women walking on the street for anatomical, biophysical evaluation. <laughs> She's watching me like a hawk. <laughs> so anyway, um, and you'll see people walk and they twist their ankles constantly. And if I went to them and said, did you twist your ankle, Jack? And you'll say, no, I didn't twist my ankle, no. But that's what they do every time every time. And when they do that continuously, they end up loosening that whole lateral stability of the ankle, knee pain, back pain, and we won't talk about all the muscles in the L3, L4 region that run up to the neck, like the capitis spinalis longus, or the longus spinalis capitis that runs right up to the nuncio line. We wouldn't talk about that because I'm a foot doctor. But that's what you need to start looking at. So the anterior tibial muscle, which shares the same fascial plate as the posterior tibial muscle, is the interesting muscle. It's a very weak muscle. And it will work 25% of the time longer than when it has to. Anybody ever hear of Jacqueline Perry? My god. Oh, good. There's somebody. I can't be this old. Anyway, the posterior tibial muscle, the anterior tibial muscle, which connects on the um, navicular-cuneiform ligament, will give you shin splints. So when people come in and complain about shin splints from running or anterior knee pain, well, maybe you better be looking at where the insertion is. Now, when the ankle goes, Always, here's the talus, and the talus is held tight by the tibia and fibula, so it doesn't rock. Well, when that joint opens up, what happens to the talus? It rocks. And what does the body try to do? The body tries to stabilize it. And so it can't. And so the anterior tibial tries. This ligament, the inferior anterior tibial fibula ligament, and just while you have your shoes off, put your hand on your fibula, that's the bone on the outside of your foot, <laughs> and you just come to where you feel the malleolus, that's that big bump on the outside, come forward and just bring it up there, just in front, just in front of that, right on right there, and that ligament is the one that really gets clobbered, because it's a very thin ligament, and ligaments are really powerful. Anybody ever make chicken soup here? Good. You ever take the wings off of a chicken? I mean, you, you, anybody still buy whole chickens? Good. Well, if you ever try to take the wing off of a chicken, there's a little piece of white fiber, and you pull it on it, and you twist it, and you can't tear it. You have to cut it. That's how strong a ligament is in a one-pound chicken. 
Can you imagine how strong it is in a 150 pound male? So the ligaments are really, really, has a lot of long, strong tensile strength. And when I use that analogy with my patient, they all know what I'm talking about. And it's a wonderful analogy to lose when people say, well, how did I tear that ligament? And you just say, well, you know anything about chickens? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you tell them this, and that, this story, and they really can visualize it. So it's a nice story. <laughs> so anyway, um, here are the ligaments. And like I said, when you do your dissection, they all look a little bit different in dissection. But in the anatomy book, you can find these. And I think that Hackett Foundation is selling these, these DVD on anatomy. And I would tell you they're a little expensive, but they are the best. And if you ever want to learn anatomy, this is the place to learn it from. You sit home by yourself and give yourself anatomy quizzes. And as you can see, all of them are kind of trying to stabilize the talus. Now, the next one is the sinus tarsi. You all know what the ACL looks like. You all know what the PCL looks like. You know what the collaterals in the knee look like. That is the knee joint. The sinus tarsi, which sits between the calcaneus and the talus, that when you walk and your foot pronates and everybody, let me tell you this, really gets to me, my foot pronates. Everybody foots pronates. If you didn't pronate, you couldn't move your hip joint. So the sinus tarsi has two ligaments in it. One is the ACL and one is the PCL. They call them different names, but that's what it is. Mother Nature never duplicates the wheel. She made it once, she ain't making it again. So this, these two ligaments are really one of the major ligaments. And there are 17 found pain generators in the sinus tarsi. So a lot of times, I'll just go in, and I heard the question in, I just use straight lidocaine or, Nova, or, or Marcaine, and I'll just inject, put some Novocaine lidocaine in the joint, manipulate it, tape it, and then they say, come on back and tell me how you feel. And if they come back and they say, well, I really felt much better while it lasted, but then I'm in the right place. If they come back and say, that didn't make a damn bit of difference, then I know I'm in the wrong place. So I use Novocaine, Lidocaine, as a diagnostic tool. As a diagnostic tool <clears throat> to know, am I in the right place? And finally, the fibular calcaneal ligament, which holds the whole ankle. And when you twist your ankle, that is as thin as it comes. And that ligament will tear constantly. So the medial ankle ligaments and how it relates to the ankle joint, the deltoid ligament, in the anatomy books, you have three deltoid ligaments, posterior, medial, and anterior. Duh. Um, and they really, when you look at it, and form follows function, and anybody knows Tom Raven, who is a reformed radiologist, will tell you rarely do you see a tear in the deltoid. Rarely. A rupture. You really have to do something. But this will stretch. So it's a good idea to learn about a little bit about prolotherapy on that. And you want to get both attachment. And the posterior tibial muscle is totally dependent, totally dependent on that ligament. Now the posterior ankle ligament, I love this, this particular area because it's so easy to get to. This is all the multiple ligaments that you will see if you look in the back. And what you see are these ligaments, the inner osseal ligament, that's what holds the fibula and tibia together, and they spread out. That ligament goes, and it's an easy one to get there. The posterior fibulotalo ligament that goes from the fibula, as it says, to the steta process on the talus. That one is probably the primary ligament you want to look to in ankle pain. The posterior deltoid, which you really generally don't touch because the arteries and the nerve run right by there and it's not necessary. There is the ligament. I would suggest that you either buy, rent, or somehow liberate a foot model. Because <laughs> even I have 
one or two in each room, and a lot of times I'll get lost, and I'll just look at it. They're so accurate. I cannot tell you why it's important to have a physical model with you, and those physical models are good. Now, this whole area here is where the posterior ankle capsular joint hooks in. And remember, what happens when you walk is your foot, your, your leg wants to fall over your, your foot. And what stops it is the Achilles tendon and the posterior joint capsule. And the way you find it is you bisect the Achilles, as you can see, you draw on the fibula, and then you divide that in half. And on the lateral side, there is nothing there that you can injure. On the medial side, you have arteries, nerve, veins. Yeah, don't do it that way. Uh, no, I'm showing the... And there we are, I'm right on the bone, and I will pepper the whole thing. And that's in your slide handout, that movie is. So the anterior ankle ligament and joints, this one I love. Here it comes. Whoa! Oh, shit. Oh, God, can you feel that? <laughs> yeah, you did that, didn't you? <laughs> so anyway, don't do skateboarding. Um, and this is how we inject it. You see I use a diabetic insulin syringe. Very simple, the tissue is very superficial. And I generally will um, infiltrate with Novocaine before I do it, that way it keeps the patient quiet. And I'll put a little shot in and then I'll walk away, come back, see a couple other patients, and then come back and it's really numb and they're not afraid and they do fine. Okay. Now, taping the ankle. I have it on my chest again. I don't know why women wear toe rings. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I'm going to show this in the lab. Um, no. Okay. We'll do, this is a skill. What you have to do is find your children and practice on them. <laughs> or your wife. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to put up two plugs in. One plug, I will be talking about posture in the AAOM meeting in April in Florida. It's an excellent meeting. And I consider these two organizations to be sisters of each other. And sometimes we fight and sometimes we make love, but we're still <laughs> sisters and brothers. Um, I could never wait. And the next thing is, with the permission of Jeff, um, the AAOM is having a course in Florida, I mean in Mexico, and we just had one spot left open. We had it filled and then somebody left. So it's an excellent meeting to go to. Um, and if you talk to May Lou, she'll be more than happy to accommodate you. And once again, I'd like to thank you all for your excellent participation. It's been my honor to give to you, and hopefully in time you will give back to me. <laughs>